thank you very much for uh, participating in the fourth attempt to uh, take this this talk. Um, hopefully the uh, microphone will work this time. Uh, this is a talk on topological spintronics in antiferromagnets and the crystal hole effect, uh, an anomalous transport in these outer magnets that we've identified. Uh, we'd like to thank the organizers for allowing us to give this talk. And also in particular, I would like to acknowledge the leading role of Leverage Mackell and um, in, in all these ideas that are originated from him actually. And uh, Thomas Youngworth, of course, my longtime collaborator, uh, which originated some many of these ideas and have been leading uh, this work. Um, the talk itself um, uh, will have three parts. Uh, well, first, we'll discuss uh, this notion of an ALS spin orbit torque, uh, which allows us for the active manipulation of an L over parameter and uh, by electrical means. And then we go on to unite uh, this manipulation of an L over parameter with a manipulation of the topological quasi particles in some antiferromagnets and continue on to show that this uh, leads to some anomalous transport in some of the systems uh, where you have. Um, this alternating uh, spin splitting in the bands uh, affording a new class of magnetic order in uh, antiferromagnets called alter magnets uh, that uh, gives us both anomalous Hall effect in the form of crystal Hall effect uh, and other phenomena. Um, antiferromagnetic spintronics, I think, is now clearly has been motivated by, by many factors. The antiferromagnetics are uh, exciting as materials for active materials and devices. Up to now they have been static materials and devices, uh, both because they have shared with the ferromagnets the fact that they are non-volatile, radiation hard, uh, but the fact that they have non at moment allows them for being, to be sensitive to primarily to magnetic fields and uh, have no fringing stray fields and therefore can scale much better. That of course challenges the fact of manipulating them, but if you are able to manipulate them, you also have exciting aspect that they have terahertz dynamics, inherently higher dynamics than the ferromagnets because of exchange enhancement and therefore optical means and the uh, communication gap is a natural bridge by these materials. And they also show multiple stable domain configurations that allows for memory logic bit cells uh, that are compatible with artificial intelligence networks, uh, etc. Do you also have the advantage that as a magnetic order, uh, it is a more prevalent than ferromagnet, so there's a, a much many more materials that show this antiferromagnetic ordering as compared to the uh, to the other one. Um, in um, antiferromagnets, uh, we've been able to manipulate them electrically now and understood how to do that now for quite a while uh, by exploiting this um, uh, ferromagnet. Um, uh, a spin orbit torque and a spin transfer torque and in this case we had um, the uh, idea uh, it's now seven years ago to can we do something similar uh, in antiferromagnets can we do the manipulation of the order parameter in this case an L order parameter in antiferromagnets to do so, uh, we exploit the concepts of the spin hole effect uh, and uh, um, also uh, the inverse spin dynamic effect, in particular, or the Edelstein effect, in which uh, by running a current in a system with broken inversion symmetry uh, and spin orbit coupling in present, uh, you are able to generate a non equilibrium polarization perpendicular to the current. Of antiferromagnets, it would not work in general because then both, both sub lattices will counter each other. But one can realize that in a centrosymmetric system, when this composed of two sub lattices with opposite inversion symmetries, one can actually generate, uh, because the spin of coupling is a local quantity, one can generate uh, a spin uh, a texture uh, with opposite chirality in the opposite sub lattices. Uh, this is uh, seen here in the AB plane of manganese to gold in this case, where you can actually see here clearly that the gold is actually in a different location, opposite location for the red and the blue sub lattice. Uh, that means that when you run a current in principle, and like we've done the direct calculations, of course, then run a global uh, initial calculations, uh, where you actually have 
uh, now uh, non-equilibrium polarization generated with opposite uh, opposite to the, the spin polarization to, in opposite cell lattices. The direction of this uh, effective current-induced anisotropy now is determined by the direction of the current itself. It is actually not connected to the actually uh, uh, magnetic order and therefore can be used to manipulate the orientation of an L order parameter if the anisotropy in the plane uh, is weak enough, because uh, you have to overcome it, of course, uh, as a function of current, because this would be pro this effective uh, non-equilibrium polarization would be proportional to the current. Uh, essentially, in a, in a simple caricature, you can think of uh, little solenoids lined up in a different part of the sublattice with opposite helicity that you can able to turn on and off uh, to reorient the uh, antiferromagnet. Uh, this was done in copper manganese isocyanide first, uh, where you have a very weak uh, in-plane um, uh, uh, anisotropy. And at low currents, you're able to see directly the switching and observe it through anisotropic magnetic resistance measurements. But at the same time, they were doing the experiments uh, using XMLD to identify and, uh, the actual large domains that you're switching when you go from one to the other, so that it's not really that is connected directly to the magnetic structure being switched and, and reoriented. Uh, once you go, you, we were able to hear in minds to actually grow manganese to go, the original proposal, and observe it as well. In here, in these experiments here, there is actually some heating effects and a contribution probably from the now newly discovered effect where you also have larger currents. And now, instead of reorienting uh, with an LR spinover torque, you are the decomposing the system from a large domains to micro domains uh, of most of the atomistic scale almost. Uh, and that uh, seems to generate uh, a current induced switching, but switching in terms of switching the resistance of the system uh, that has some memory effects as well. Uh, but that is a unipolar effect uh, that, that, that came from these studies. Um, on the other hand, we focused ourselves uh, at that time on the uh, nail spin and ask the question, can we now exploit this new way of manipulating the antiferromagnetic order by electrical means, by currents, and connect it to topological Dirac fermions in antiferromagnetics? This was the question posed by uh, Lewis Schmeichel, uh, who came to us and said, okay, well, you know, we have a Dirac topological materials that now have been coexisting uh, with the uh, studies in antiferromagnetic spectronics and, and spintronics in general uh, for a while, uh, but not really connecting to directly, can we connect them? And the answer, of course, is yes, uh, because here you have two overlapping symmetry conditions that are actually come to, to aid. Uh, you need two sites in the, in the unit cells at least, uh, the one of them, of course, and the one of the collinear antiferromagnets that we have uh, is to afford us these inversion partner sites that can give us these stagger fields that we can induce by the currents and in the other one by the creation of the band crossing, so otherwise you wouldn't have any band crossing. And the fact that you have to have PT symmetry being conserved, which will be in the case of, say, graphene, uh, but you also will have uh, the PT itself, the endoparity, time uh, local parity, and time reversal is not conserved, but PT is conserved uh, because of the appearance of these inversion partners, side partners. Uh, putting this into a simple model, uh, you can put, you know, I, that is simple antiferromagnet. We have the hopping, we have antiferromagnetic coupling and spin orbit coupling added to it. In this case, the KML type of coupling. And <clears throat> depending now on the orientation of the nail order parameter, so here we just simply solve this effective model that I just wrote earlier, and you will have uh, this. Um, uh, uh, this is the paramagnet, of course, where you have the normal crossings here, the normal the aquasic particles at the X and M and prime points. <clears throat> but you will also have now, uh, in the, uh, depending on the orientation of the antiferromagnetic order, the 0, 0, 1, or the 1, or the 1, or other direction, that you will end up with massive Dirac quasic particles, or you will protect your Dirac quasic particles, so the Dirac quasic particles uh, are shifted in momentum space and clearly uh, protected by some symmetry. In this case, the protection of this is actually given by non-symorphic symmetries where you combine a point-grown symmetry and a non-trivial translation 
and here the sample this is this in this case of, uh, of example that we have um, is due to this uh, mirror plane uh, mirror and uh, uh, symmetry and, and half translation that you can actually see easily here so in the mirror uh, inversion because of the spin is a pseudo vector the par the the spin components perpendicular to it does not get affected so if you have the orientation perpendicular to this mirror plane once you do the mirror to operation this goes to here this goes to there like we saw here and you do the half translation you end up back with the same system so there's a symmetry of the system if on the other hand the orientation is not perpendicular to that mirror plane then you end up with a different orientation so it's not a symmetry and that actually uh, uh, creates this gap uh, the calculations of course in real materials in this case in orthorhombic copper manganese arsenide and this is important because in, in this case uh, the, uh, the these aquasin particles that can be manipulated now by the direction of the nail order parameter which in part of course we can manipulate by the nail spin of the torque that the currents that we put through the system uh, will open or close the gaps uh, near the fermi surface uh, this is vital to have a strong effects in the resistivity uh, creating an effective uh, semiconductor uh, different gaps and create changing the resistivity quite a lot this will bring the anisotropic magnetic resistance which simply is a very small effect of a few percent to percentages of 50 percent competing almost with uh, gmr and, and tmr effects sometimes um, you can see that this is, uh, is happening by that the orientation of the NLR parameter is actually changing uh, your band structure quite a lot as you're reoriented. This is for the case for the orthorhombic one. The experiments, I should point out, were done in the tetragonal, where in the tetragonal, the actual crossings, these actual direct crossing particles, are farther away from the Fermi surface, and the effects on the AMR on the transport will be more indirect and, and weaker uh, for uh, by nature. Um, then uh, we segue directly into looking at anomalous transport and in particular the anomalous crystal hole effect uh, and spin plittings in antiferromagnets, uh, which was highlighted in the previous talk of Thomas Angworth uh, identifying the new class of materials so called alternative. Uh, this new class of materials we want to emphasize um, that uh, is uh, obtained by looking back at the spin symmetries, essentially turning off the uh, different magnet uh, directly and uh, then uh, going to the uh, uh, going to um, uh, the origins of, of, the, of the ordering uh, where you can identify of course the ferromagnets uh, this is the groups that have uh, no transposite symmetries between the sublattices and then you have exchange magnetization being present and a clear split of the bands whereas in these normal antiferromagnets uh, the spin reversal symmetry, RS, is a symmetry of your system and uh, it also comes to the fact that uh, you will have the transposing symmetries uh, between the sublattices being a translation on parity and, and naturally of course uh, RS will be uh, a symmetry of this type of linear antiferromagnets. On the other hand, if this is spin flip um, that is independent now of the of the spatial uh, uh, symmetry uh, operations um, comes only with a rotation symmetry that trans a rotation not transposing symmetry uh, uh, that, uh, that transposes one sublattice into the other you are going to end up with this called alter magnet which allows for alternating spin momentum coupling this means that in translation in terms of the band structure uh, in the ferromagnets you have the normal splitting of the bands up and down in the antiferromagnet the normal ferromagnets where rs the spin flip uh, symmetry is a symmetry you just have the spin up the spin degeneracy per band and in these other ones in the asalter magnets the band with alternative spin polarization with different here, this polarization will be split in one and opposite in the other because, because you still have the antiferromagnetic order, meaning that you have m equal to zero. The total magnetization is zero in this collinear alter magnet. And then, <clears throat> with that in mind, uh, we can now look at a particular material, a particular uh, 
Uh, ruthenium oxide is one of them, of course, it's been, as we have identified earlier. Oh, uh, sorry, I don't think I've mentioned it in the talk, uh, yeah, as we have identified uh, in previous works as well, uh, where here uh, you can then see clearly the splitting of the bands uh, in, uh, between the gamma and the S uh, system, and other uh, bands uh, are degenerate in other directions of the brain. So, yeah, this gives us uh, some transport phenomena that is not usual in the, the antiferromagnetic. Uh, one first example, the fact that, you know, even just turning on without a spin orbit coupling, you can turn on, you can uh, obtain a um, spinhole effect directly. And this spinhole effect is a different type uh, in the one that has been studied for a long time and the one I actually predicted long ago in 2003, the intrinsic spinhole effect is an even uh, time spinhole effect. And uh, this one, in this case, we use an at uh, in time electrical spin splitter, uh, where this is actually generated not from the interband transitions, but from the fact that you have this clear anisotropy induced by the symmetry uh, of the crystal. And then when you write, when you run a current in this particular direction, you will generate spin current opposite to it, uh, perpendicular to it, uh, just by the fact that this is a spin ups and a spin downs. Um, in this part of the balloon, so um, at the gamma point. Uh, this gives you a very strong uh, Hall effect of the order of 34 degrees, which is vast compared to the usual ones of the usual materials with the strong spin orbit coupling. And in here again, the generation of the spin current is independent of the spin orbit coupling, uh, which is a, a very um, interesting um, notion. Uh, you can also exploit and look at this alternating uh, structure of the spin uh, in a model system uh, where you actually have now uh, this um, uh, this condition to where you have the uh, um, in the gamma point you have this D uh, wave type of, uh, of, of symmetry and um, in the valleys you actually have even in momentum space um, uh, spin polarization. And this is opposite to the typical valetronic materials, conventional valetronics where it's adding momentum, so this would be opposite spin varieties or pseudo spins, whereas here these are even in momentum. And uh, this the idea that you can actually go into creating giant magnetoresistant devices where you have now, you try to essentially flip the polarization here by reorienting the nail order in one and the opposite um, uh, material and creating in this fairly large uh, GMRs of a phenomenal that, in, 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 that are observed in ferromagnets. Here the challenge could be of course how to reorient uh, these this two nail order parameters so that you do have these 90 degree, 180 degrees domains um, between them. Uh, so for, for multi-domain it would be challenging to do. On the other hand, you can also go to the tunneling effects and in here you exploit the valleys and uh, the calculation here done by Anna, Anna Birk um shows a very strong uh, also 100% uh, uh, type of TMR effect uh, that is very, uh, very strong as well and, and useful. Then um, that we want to jump into the anomalous hole effect. Uh, in these materials. And here, anomalous or spontaneous anomalous hole effect has been one of the workhorses in the magnetic systems and trying to identify them and characterize them. And an important thing to understand of the anomalous hole effect is the fact that for any hole effect to be present in your system, you have to have a symmetry in the system that allows for the pseudo vector to exist. <clears throat> and because here the whole current is given you naturally by the cross product of this whole vector uh, given by these components of the conductivity and the electric field. This means that uh, in a ferromagnet this will naturally always be present uh, if you have a spin orbit coupling because, or allowed by symmetry at least uh, because you have um, now um, essentially uh, magnetization allowing the, in, the, in the equilibrium which automatically gives you the presence by symmetry and allowance of um, pseudo vector, which is a magnetization. Uh, on the other hand, it was already uh, understood a few years ago now that in, an, in some non-collinear antiferromagnets that symmetry also is allowed 
um, in this complex uh, antiferromagnets and you have to observe an aerosol effect in uh, antiferromagnets. On the other hand, this antiferromagnet is non-collinear one, tends to be complex, very sensitive and difficult to work with. And we wanted to see if there was actually such a thing as an anomalous effect in a collinear antiferromagnet, something that is usually would be very attractive to experimentalists because collinear antiferromagnets are, of course, the simplest version of antiferromagnet. Uh, by looking once again at the analysis of the symmetry, the symmetric symmetries, uh, 122 point groups that we have, uh, you can identify in there uh, 22 that allows for these Dirac antiferromagnets and 31 that allows for spontaneous whole antiferromagnets in terms of the point groups, magnetic point groups, but 14 uh, which also are compatible with collinear antiferromagnetic order. So it has actually a large room in here, actually 10% of the materials in the Bilbao magnetic uh, library, the materials library, uh, allow for such a, such a uh, such a and this, of course, came in contrast to the typical intuition with an antiferromagnet, uh, collinear antiferromagnet, where usually just by looking at the magnetic order, just by looking at the arrows of the orientation of the spin, you will automatically identify this as a not possible to be an, uh, an antiferromagnet, uh, to show an anomalous Hall effect, because here, just by looking at this, uh, you would actually uh, identify this point as the inversion point between these two spins, so you can invert these two spins and flip the spins by time reversal and this gives you an effective time reversal symmetry that then you would, uh, uh, it would forbid the presence of a pseudo vector, uh, essentially an axial vector that then uh, this uh, will also prevent anomalous Hall effect. On the other hand, uh, if you remember or you remind oneself that the crystal environment, the non-magnetic crystal environment can influence and that in reality one should look at the magnetic densities, uh, to the symmetry of the magnetic densities of the material, then you're in better business. Uh, here is an example of, um, uh, um, uh, um, of uh, magnetic oxide uh, where you have, uh, magnesium oxide, sorry, where you have a, uh, now the, the, the this this um, uh, cages these hexagonal cages uh, now reorienting and breaking the symmetry for the spin densities as you can see you don't have this time reversal effective time reversal symmetry um, when you actually switch between the two uh, because if you do the inversion symmetry point and then time reversal you will not end up with the same um, uh, spin density structure. You can do the calculation uh, here uh, uh, and then uh, obtain a very similar um, uh, uh, but, uh, the, the various calculation of uh, the various phase uh, with, uh, with the spin-over coupling. And uh, without spin-over coupling, of course, it would be zero with the spin-over coupling. The key thing is that it's a very strong uh, in contributions where you have the crossings between this is effective spin split bands uh, that we've seen in the in the previous materials and uh, and then um, uh, the actual value of them can be as large as uh, 330 cents per centimeter even though in these systems which are actually called weak antiferromagnets uh, you have a very very small magnetization and here in this slide I want to emphasize that uh, these materials prior were called weak antiferromagnets because they show weak antiferromagnets if you do count them, uh, uh, and, but, and thought that, okay, the anomalous effect will come from this counting that will be proportional to this small counting. This is not the case. Uh, the anomalous effect that is predicted is not proportional to this magnetization. It's actually independent of that. And uh, you, of course, will have a contribution, small contribution to it, um, but nothing else. Uh, it, it would, you know, the, the large value is actually due to this crystal environment. This is why we've, we've uh, termed it here crystal hall effect to identify in here not the fact that it's spontaneous hall effect, but to, which is well, all of them are, uh, but to identify the microscopic origin. Uh, the experiments actually in the observation have been done by the team of uh, CQ uh, Liu uh, in China. Uh, in this beautiful uh, ruthenium oxide, um, sorry, ruthenium oxide, I think I mentioned, uh, I think I think I misspoke, uh, the, the material is ruthenium oxide, 
uh, um, uh, materials uh, in a growing NGO and an SDO. And in here, uh, then is a topic crystal resistivity after the subtracting the binary Hall effect. Um, you you see a very clear anomalous Hall effect. Um, now, uh, the subtraction is a little tricky because it has to be, you still have to do the experiments in field because the orientation of the NL parameter is actually not uh, conducive to see the anomalous Hall effect. This is another characteristic of this anomalous Hall effect in antiferromagnets where you actually uh, now, depending on the orientation of an L order parameter, your symmetry will allow or not for an anomalous Hall effect. And this is in contrast to the normal ferromagnets where you would actually turn it on and off. We, we would never be able to turn it off by the symmetry. Uh, the actual experiments agree fairly well with the magnitude that we've predicted. And also the orientation in here uh, seems to indicate that we will um, that it is uh, conducive to being canted enough uh, by this field uh, to uh, observe it. Uh, so this, these things, in this case, is uh, indirect evidence that there is an agreement. We're doing further experiments to convince uh, the, the experimentalists, uh, the, the referees, um, that, the orient that we have a handle on the orientation of the ruthenium oxide order parameter, uh, which is, of course, a challenge here uh, from the point of view of observ observation. Um, because in this sense, this is not a spontaneous Hall effect because it's the, the, the nail order parameter is not spontaneously in the correct direction. Another one, the material that now we've observed farther, this uh, spontaneous crystal Hall effect, is this uh, manganese 5 silicon 3 films. And here, these are distinct films where the challenge you have seen now is spontaneous, clearly spontaneous uh, anomalous Hall effect in their at zero fields perpendicular to the plane. But here the challenge now is in identifying whether this is actually collinear order, a collinear antiferromagnetic order. This is not something that is totally clear because this material has not been identified to be collinear antiferromagnet first. Theoretically it is, but of course we have to, this is an experimental science after all. And um, whereas in the, in the ruthenium oxide, you do have uh, this very clear uh, um, uh, establishment, it's been established clearly by different groups that these are uh, collinear antiferromagnets. Um, in, in the other one, in the ruthenium oxide, the challenge is to identify the orientation of it all. So with this, I think I'm uh, out of my time. I think uh, one minute to tell you about the summary. Um, so I've tried to tell you the story of how we've gone from the spin hole effect and the inverse spin and valley effect that we studied now for a long time unexploited, uh, in particular in using spin talks to uh, flip single antiferromagnets to fer ferromagnets <clears throat> and exploit that and, and translate that directly to our notion to the to uh, predicting this nail, the spin torque in a single layer antiferromagnet. Um, this prediction being observed almost a year later or a very short time later in, in copper magnet arsenide and using this orientation, this uh, manipulation of the uh, antiferromagnetic order <clears throat> to manipulate and predict the manipulation of uh, topological Dirac uh, quasi particles that can affect strongly uh, the transport properties of the system. Uh, with this, uh, we also um, identified uh, the, in this new class of, uh, as, as, as has been described in the previous lecture, uh, class of materials, uh, alter magnets, which are uh, antiferromagnets with uh, which possess a translational um, transposing symmetry that is rotation uh, combined with the spin uh, flip, uh, with spin uh, reversal. And um, these ones generate a lot of trans anomalous transfer behavior, can be exploited to create GMR devices, GMR devices, and often observe the uh, strong anomalous Hall effect. And with this, I thank you for your time and I hope to. Um, uh, to have good discussions in the workshop.